Again, it is the honor of the entire community, clergy, and professional staff of Westchester Reformed Temple that Dr. Eliza Erber is with us this evening, I should say back with us. It is such a nice reunion to have somebody who has already distinguished herself as a caring, compassionate, and loving teacher here at WRT, here tonight to teach all of us through the lens of memory and family story. We're especially grateful as well to our partners at the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center of New York, who have uh, partnered with us in bringing Dr. Erber back to the Westchester Reform Temple to hold forth with us tonight to share her story. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It feels like coming home. It really does. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I always feel a little overwhelmed when I'm about to speak um, about my family's Holocaust experience. But I want to share with you that the opportunity to honor those who have perished um, is a real, a real honor uh, to do. And also, not only the ones who have perished, but I also want to mention that it's a real honor to uh, remember the ones who survived, well not remember, they're here, um, all the people who survived who despite everything that they went through have managed to pick themselves up, put one foot in front of the other and um, establish new families and live. That's our commandment, life above all for us. So Okay, this is a slightly different setup for me, so bear with me, uh, please. There we go. Okay, so um, my Austrian Dutch family was just what I consider to be an ordinary um, family. My grandfather, the fellow back here with the mustache, if you see him, nod your head. If you see my cursor, thank you. Um, he was an artist, a professional painter, a professional artist, uh, and made a very nice living uh, at that. Uh, he lived in Vienna, Austria, and uh, married there. And then my mom, who's the young lady, she's about 15 over here, uh, was born in Vienna as well. And uh, shortly after her birth, her mom passed away and my grandfather had two sisters as well as his own mother uh, in Holland. And so he brought his infant daughter to Holland and uh, she was raised there by her Tante Emma. Tante means aunt, uh, by her Aunt Emma. And uh, Tante Ella was in there as well. And Oma, which means grandma, Oma Babette, um, was around, so it was a whole, uh, there was a whole nuclear family. Um, uh, Oma, uh, Tante Emma over here next to my mom uh, had two sons, Kurt and Hans, and Hans had a girlfriend that he was going to, um, he was engaged to, to be married. So life was really good. Uh, for my mom growing up. The family was well-to-do. My mom had her own German Shepherd, her own pet. It didn't belong to anyone else but her. And um, she showed a lot of talent uh, as a young woman, a young girl at the time, and she was accepted into one of the most prestigious uh, art schools in The Hague. Um, my mom actually abandoned her art um, 
for many years. She returned to it after she retired, unfortunately. I mean, unfortunately, she abandoned it. it, it I, I would have wished for her to continue with that in which she had so much to give and such a, a good uh, talent. The family had uh, a cook. My mother had a nanny even when she was older and they had two chambermaids. So as you can see, they were well to do and life was really, really good. So, um, uh, my mother actually, um, when she went to art school, um, showed a lot of promise. I, I keep saying that, but um, how do I go back? Uh, hold on. Yeah. Um, when my parents retired to Israel, back to Israel, um, she finally went back to do some art, and she went and started doing um, statues and stuff like that. And she also did very nicely with that, even with a 50-year or 40-year hiatus um, in between her artwork. I put a necklace on that lady because one of my grandchildren didn't like it. Um, <laughs> like that. So as I said, the family was ordinary, regular. Everybody went to school, everybody did their thing, everybody was happy. It was really wonderful until uh, the Germans arrived in The Hague. So my mother grew up in a rather secular uh, home. She knew very little about Judaism, and if she ever thought about her family religious affiliations at all, she probably actually would have considered herself a Christian. Her grandmother, Oma Babette, my great-grandmother, whom of course I never met, uh, was born and raised Roman Catholic in Hungary, Budap in Budapest, Hungary. As a young woman, uh, Oma Babette happened to visit Vienna. She went to the theater, because that's what you did when you went to Vienna. She met the actor, she went to the theater, she, went to, she met the actor, they fell in love and they ended up getting married and going uh, to Holland. And, um, well, they lived in, in Vienna first, then to Holland. And, um, forgive me, I, I, I get lost a little bit sometimes. So they had three children, and my grandfather was the oldest, and he had the two sisters. Uh, they didn't celebrate Judaism, and they didn't celebrate Christianity. I think they might have had a Christmas tree during Christmas, and that's, that's about it. The fact that she was one religion and that he was another absolutely did not impact on their lives. They had a good life. They, they loved it. Their neighbors, there was a mixed population, and it really didn't matter at all. And of course, that ended when the Nazis arrived. I'm ahead of myself. That's Oma Babette with um, two of her children. The third one wasn't born yet. I, I'm going in the wrong direction, I think. Hold on, guys. Yeah. My mom, okay. When the Nazis came into The Hague, they arrived in May of 1940. And their plan was to capture Queen Wilhelmina, the Dutch queen, have her surrender, and that way defeat uh, Holland. It didn't happen because the queen was immediately whisked off to London, and she spent the war years uh, in, in London. The changes for my mother and the rest of the... Um, population, especially the Jewish population, but also the Dutch population, came very swiftly. At first, there were signs that were tacked on bulletin boards outside and on trees, literally. Signs such as, um, Jews are not allowed to walk in the park. Jews are not allowed to shop in Christian shops. Uh, oh, and the most important one, Jews must register. 
Now, that was the most severe because the moment you register, the Germans had your information and they could find you uh, anytime. My mother had a very good friend by the name of Meep, who actually then became engaged to my mother's cousin Hans. And she was not Jewish and she was able to go anywhere uh, within the town and she would come uh, often to the apartment to let my family know what, um, what was going on and, and what the, the rules were. And all of a sudden, and I don't know if you can wrap your brain around that, but all of a sudden, my mother who, uh, and her family uh, now were Jewish. Hitler instituted the blood laws. And uh, so if somewhere in your family, uh, someone married um, a, a Jew. If you were a Christian, you married a Jew. And that Jew, even if that Jew converted, you now became a Christian, or vice versa. I always get that mixed up, I don't know. I have to look at it a bit more carefully. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, at first, Jewish men began to disappear. In the beginning, they came home again after being beaten and whatever. But after a while, they no longer came home. Then not only Jewish men, but Jewish, but a whole, whole Jewish families uh, disappeared. And that's one of the things that happened to my uncle, my great uncle Leopold, uh, Tante Emma's husband. He was taken right off the street, taken to Gestapo headquarters, then he disappeared. And they couldn't find out what happened to him, where he was, not even with the help of the underground, which they all were very active uh, in. So following Uncle Leopold's uh, disappearance, uh, my mother's aunt Emma, Tante Emma, went into a deep depression. And my mother assumed the care of the household. The cook was gone. The chambermaids were gone because Christians were no longer allowed to work for Jews. So the spoiled little girl, who was still a teenager, by the way, had to assume the responsibility for the household. And on top of her domestic duties, she also had to go and find food. So the thing was, is that Jews were not allowed to shop in Christian shops. They, if there was any food available, they were the ones who had the food. So people like my mother had to go literally forage and scrounge, scrounge around to find food, and, and sometimes uh, farmers uh, would sell them. But it was a very, very difficult situation, and after a while, um, starvation set in. Amsterdam suffered very badly during the war from lack of nutrition. My mom became an, a Dutch underground fighter, the same as my grandfather and uh, my mother became engaged to be married, and he also. So everybody in my family was a Dutch underground fighter. And because of that, they were able to, they were able to find hiding places because my grandfather knew that there was going to come a day when they are no longer co going to be able to just be out there like the Christian population. So they arranged for hiding places just in case they had to. Well, they did. Uh, in 1942, my grandfather received notice uh, through the underground that the family was put on a deportation list. And that meant that they had to go underground or into hiding ASAP, immediately. These hiding places, as I just said, were secure, secure ahead of time. Now, when they first went into hiding, my mother discovered that she was pregnant. Uh, but that was already after they had secured hiding places, so there was absolutely no hiding place for me because they didn't know I was coming. One of the first hiding places, okay, I forget which way to go. One of the first hiding places for my mom was with a farm family the Leffers family, and I always make sure I remember to say their name because they were upstanding uh, people. 
And they already had eight children. And uh, they took my mother, lightened her hair a little bit because she had very dark hair, and she became child number nine. Didn't last very long, unfortunately, because the Nazis started invading uh, most of the area around, and they came to check the farms as well. And my mother tells, us, uh, tells of a time when she was, um, the Nazis were coming, the Germans were coming, and she had to run into the barn to hide, and she would hide under the hay, sometimes for hours. Very difficult situation, very difficult to breathe. And at one such time, the Germans did come in. They must have smelled something because they took their bayonets and started um, hitting at the hay. My mom was okay. She didn't get hit. But she was 19, 18 years old. I can't imagine myself at the age of 18 not opening my mouth and screaming or something when the bayonets are coming right next to me. So the Leffer family, as some other farm families in Holland, uh, also worked with the underground. And they were not Jewish, they were Christian, uh, Dutch, and, uh, but they got, they got paid for hiding uh, people in their homes. And I want you to understand that even if they got paid, it was still a very heroic thing for them to do because if the Nazis found a Jew on their property, all of them would have been killed immediately. So it's just a, an, an amazing thing. It was very difficult, whether you were a Jew or not a Jew, uh, to help a Jew if you were not a Jew because your life was on the line doing so. My mother's grandmother, Oma Babette, as I had mentioned before, was a Roman Catholic who had raised her three children. Is she up there? Yeah. Uh, who had raised her three children marginally as Catholics. Uh, and that includes, of course, my grandfather and his two sisters. Eventually, many years later, when the Nazis came, they rounded her up. At the age of 85, they shoved her onto a cattle car without windows, without food, without water, without toilet facilities. She survived the trip, which I think was two or three days, crowded body against body at that age, at the age of 85, only to be murdered the moment she got to Auschwitz. They put her in the, concert, in the uh, gas chamber. This is a stock photo. Obviously, I don't have a photo of the train that she was on. So this is a stock photo that I found online. This is Cousin Kurt. And the reason I bring that picture up is because this must have been early on. Uh, because I see from his demeanor that he's not all that worried right now. Um, but what I want to show is the Jewish star that he already had, that they already had to, to put on. And I have at home a picture of my grandfather, my mother, and his two daughters from, from his marriage, his second marriage. Uh, and they're all, even the children, are wearing uh, the Jewish stars. Um, both cousins, Hans was murdered at the age of 32, Kurt was murdered at the age of 36. They were caught while working for the underground. And Meep, who was able to get into Gestapo headquarters, uh, tried very, very hard to figure out where they all went because it wasn't just them, it was also other members of their cell, underground cell. And uh, she found out that they were taken to concentration camp where they died. I, I was told this by my Aunt Betty, who is 85, almost 86 years old now. She's a little older than I. When my grandfather remarried, he had a second family. My mom was 16 already. 
So, um, and she and I are very close, and we sit and we talk. She was a hidden child, because she was already here when they arranged hiding places, so they knew to arrange a hiding, and she had a hiding place with a family, a Christian family, whom she called Mama and Papa, only she refused to do that, and she's still very stubborn, and she would... <laughs> she would uh, tell them that I have a mama and a papa, you're not my mama and my papa. And she tells that she actually went to, to sleep, to bed at times without supper because they had to teach her that she had to do this. Otherwise, everyone was in jeopardy. This is my mother and my biological father, Richard Levy. Um, they became engaged during all of this upheaval, and they were supposed to get married. And Richard was also in the underground. And his job with the underground was to get notices from someone who had infiltrated the uh, Gestapo headquarters, get a list of the people that were put on, on transport lists, and then go and smuggle this one out and that one out. That was his job. And in one of, of those uh, times, he actually was caught. And after being held in prison in The Hague for a few days, he was sent to a Dutch concentration camp that had started out as a transport camp and uh, called Westerbork. Uh, he was at Westerbork for a while before he was um, transported out of Westerbork. And this is the man who... This is the man who my mom was married to later. She married him, and I'll show you something after this. And um, he was my biological father. And he's a father I never met. I never met him. He died bef I mean, He died when I was already a year and something old, but not where I was. He was in a different concentration camp. I was underground. Um, this is a very remarkable document, guys. This is a marriage certificate from Westerborg. My mom had gotten permission to go to Westerborg to visit him, and uh, they got married. And if you look way on top here, it says Westerbork. And that's very unique. All of these documents are going to end up at the uh, Holocaust Museum in the city um, when I'm finished um, here. And on, on one side is the information of my uh, biological father's parents. And on this side is my mom, Helga Steiner is her name. And another remarkable thing is that they were married by the camp commandant, the Nazi camp commandant, and he signed um, the certificate. My mom also tells, once I've learned about Richard, uh, she told me that he was the eternal optimist. He wrote her letters from Westerbork, and he always thought that Westerbork was but a temporary pit stop, so to speak. He was going to come home again, um, which, of course, did not, unfortunately, did, did not happen. This is a letter he wrote my mom uh, from Westerbork, and this is at a time when Westerbork already became a uh, labor uh, camp and a starvation camp, because they didn't feed the people. And uh, it's over 80 years old. This was written before uh, I was born, and I turned 80 this month. So this, this is over 80 years old, and it's on very, very thin paper, and both sides of the paper are written in very, very small print so that he could save uh, paper. But in this letter, he tells my mom to, um, that they're planning in the camp to, to have a party of some sort to boost the morale, um, and, and could she please send a package of food because there was no food available. And also he asked her if she'd gone to the doctor. He wanted to, make, to find out if she was pregnant or not. So, let me move on here. 
Okay. From Westerbork, my father, by the way, Tuesdays were the dreaded transport days at Westerbork. And um, the people who were weaker because of the starvation or who got sick for some reason, so on Tuesdays they would pick those people out, put them on a transport to Auschwitz or Berlin-Belsen or Dachau. And um, unfortunately, my father ended up on one of those. And he was uh, transported from uh, Westerbork to Dachau. When I, uh, no, to Theresienstadt, to Theresien. In Theresien, I went there um, with a play, and I went to the records room, and there was a young woman who sat, and there were ledger books, blue ledger books, on shelves, and I walked in and I gave her my father's name. It took her less than 30 seconds to bend down. He was on the lower shelf, pull out a uh, ledger book, and she opened it up to page six, and he was name number 12, or vice versa, page 12, and he's name number six. Um, How come it's moving on its own? Um, So that's that's Levi Richard, uh, his date of birth, and um, some numbers, and I'm not quite sure what those numbers represent. Um, So from there, he went to Theresienstadt. Okay. In Theresienstadt, I'm not in the right place, guys. Don't know where I am. Hold on, bear with me. Okay, let me go back. I, I don't, forgive me. I'm, this is a different system for me, so <laughs> I'm a little bit off, but you're going to get the, the, um, gist, the gist of it. Um, I was born on April 2nd, 1943, in a small town called Almelo, where my family hid to get away from the Nazis. It was felt that the Nazis were less likely to go into a small town like that to look for Jews Uh, But that was wrong. Eventually, they infiltrated every town in Holland, uh, and they found a town. And when that happened, my mother really literally disappeared. She had to disappear. And in my case, because they didn't know where to put me, um, they put me there. This is a bunker underneath the ground, and a righteous doctor, a righteous uh, Christian doctor, who also worked with the underground, took 10 of us infants and put us in this hole underneath the ground. No windows, no doors. I tried to highlight the air vents, and if you can see up here, this is outside of the bunker. So there is a pipe over here, which was snaked down, and then the other end of the pipe was bent into uh, the hole. Uh, into this bunker, and I believe that there are two on either side uh, of the walls. Um, There was no light, there was no sound, because they taped our mouths shut, because sound carries, we were babies. And um, they fed us, from what I understand, once a day, uh, boiled grasses and tulip bulbs. This doctor eventually paid with his own life. I don't know what happened to the two nurses that worked with him. I was there for almost two years, almost two solid years, without nutrition, without seeing the sun, without seeing the sky, without seeing the air, and without human contact. Now I know why I am the way I am. (laughs) But it is not a joking matter. This bunker was found, it was discovered, and I don't know what happened to the other children 
who were in that bunker. I'm glad I'm here. And something else that occurs to me that Rabbi Blake mentioned before that 1,500,000 children perished, were murdered during the Holocaust. If it wasn't for this righteous doctor, it would have been 1,500,000 and one. So I'm very grateful to be able to be here and talk to you today. Of course, my mother did not know where I was. When she tried to find out, they told her that it was better that she not know because if they caught her, she couldn't divulge what she didn't know. She couldn't tell what she didn't know. So I want to share a little bit with you how I found my father. Um, because I didn't know about him. I didn't know anything about him all my growing up years. And um, maybe I have it in here later, but I'll tell you now that my mom was very ill. We were already in the, in, the, in the United States, and I was 17 or so years old, and she got very ill, and I stayed home. And I was apologizing to her, as I always did, because I wanted to be an actor. And they didn't want their daughter to be an actor. My father was Viennese, and he said, all actresses were whores, so there you go. <laughs> so I could not follow what I really wanted to do. I'm not sorry about it today, but then I was angry. And um, I stayed with her from school, uh, home from school, to ta help take care of her. She was really ill. And I apologized to her for being so difficult for my father. We're talking about my stepfather because she remarried. And she looked me straight in the face and she said, he's not your father. And I said, well, where is my father? Who is my father? And that she, then she told me about Richard Livy, who died at concentration camp. Maybe I'll get to it again, I don't know. So aside from being a rabbinic pastor and a teacher, a podiatric physician, I'm also a playwright and an actor, and in the, I went back to acting, guys. And in the year 2000, the theater group that I was with uh, brought our acting company to the Czech Republic, which in my school days was called Czechoslovakia, to perform a Holocaust play at the second international Jewish arts festival in Prague. For me, it was the beginning of a journey and quest that I had not yet, that has not yet ended and will probably stay with me for the rest of my life. I had very little knowledge of the Holocaust or how my family had suffered during the Holocaust. And even though I knew I was born in Holland during the Holocaust, no one in my Holocaust survivor family ever spoke about anything, and certainly not to the children. Uh, so I really didn't know anything, but my hope is that you hear, you're listening, that children uh, are taught and that they will understand that we can never, ever, ever forget any evil that goes about and is, is, is anywhere uh, in this world, and there's plenty of it, but anti-Semitism is on the rise so badly right now that I am scared. So we were going with the, the company, acting company and, and I, all of us, were going to visit Theresienstadt, Terezin. And I want you to use your imagination for a minute. It was a misty and rainy day. And we were in the middle of the woods because the road to Theresienstadt was in the middle of the woods. And we are on a bus. Uh, and we were bus all of all Jews because not only were the actors uh, Jewish except for one, um, and uh, the directors and, and uh, the organizers, but also there were a, a handful of tourists who had joined this particular trip uh, to go visit the concentration camps. And the bus, it just stopped all of a sudden in the middle of the road, in the middle of the woods. Uh, it just stopped. And the woods were so beautiful. They, they were wet 
from the mist on the outside and so very verdant and so green. But the bus stopped and all when we started smelling something like burning. And now we think about that. I, I know that I was sitting there and I was shaking. I, I was the only survivor on this bus, the only person who has some sort of a history, uh, which of course I didn't share with anyone at the time. And here we were, a bus full of Jews on our way to a concentration camp that not very long ago, and it wasn't just a concentration camp, it was an extermination camp uh, in a city where not so very long ago, Jews were hunted down, tortured, killed, and burnt. And the smell of burn was in the air. For me, it was a little too much reality. The first, they sent another bus, and the first thing we saw when we arrived at, Ter at Terezin was a field of graves with a red rose bush at each head, um, what do you call those, a he head thing, stone, headstone. And um, vivid red, misty day, gray sky, very green grass. And when you looked up, by the way, these uh, bodies that were buried in these graves were not necessarily whole bodies. They were arms from this, bones they found, legs from that bone, a skull from here, because the bones were in pits. So they just pulled together and made a, a, a body. And those are the bodies who are buried in those graves. There are no names on these headstones just numbers. When you look up from there, this is the entrance to Theresienstadt, black and white, black and white, very, very stark. And if you take a look at the grass on top, that's what my bunker, my hiding bunker looked like. They had the grass on top of the bunker so people didn't know that there was a hiding place uh, underneath. And this is one of the, it's, it's moving on its own, guys. I'm not touching it. <laughs> Um, and uh, in one of the rooms that we passed, and, and look how stark it is, by the way. There's no flower, no trees, nothing. And with the door open, we passed a room that was considered a torture room. And on the wall were these handcuffs. And if you look hard enough, you can see how raw the wall behind these handcuffs are. And of course, with my imagination, I immediately pictured my father there. Finally, our guide brought us to barracks number four. Barracks number four was the barracks where my father was interned. It was a small room with those wooden bunks along three walls, as you guys have seen already in other pictures uh, where the prisoners slept. Um, the, the walls were um, stone, and they went all the way up, and at the ceiling, they came in and then pitched up like that, and that pitched part of that room was made out of opaque glass, and that was the only light that came into that room. There were also two small toilets at the entrance to that room. And this room originally was built to house 150 prisoners. By the time my father got there, it housed 600 men, most of them ill with dysentery, and um, typhus. Typhus is a highly infectious disease that causes high fevers, headaches, delirium, and death. And dysentery is an uh, infection of the intestines. And since two small toilets were not enough, <sighs> these prisoners slept, ate, and sat in fecal material. Condensation would rise up to the glass ceiling and rain down in droplets upon them. No wonder they all caught typhus. And all of a sudden, I find myself alone in that room. 
Everybody went out. I didn't even hear the guide telling us I was, I think, in an altered state at that moment. And they all left, and I was standing there. I, I wanted to touch all the wood. I wanted to touch every part of that womb that possibly my father had touched. It was really important to me. So I walked around, touching every bit of surface, because I needed to touch what my father had touched. I needed to touch the wood that my father had touched. I wanted to stand with him and say, I love you. I couldn't. Instead, I buried my face in my hands, and I said the morning, I recited the morning's Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead. My sense of loss and grief was acute and overpowering. This was my father's last confinement, slave confinement, before he was sent on to Auschwitz. And he was sent on to Auschwitz because he was very ill. Barracks number four in Terezin was the last stop for my father before he was sent to Auschwitz, where he succumbed to the typhus. He was 32 years old. His crime, he was born a Jew. What you're looking at now is my father, Bert. My father, Bert, was part of the Brigada, the Jewish part of the British Army. And uh, he fought in, um, in Italy, in northern Italy. And um, one of the things that I know about him, he was very young. He uh, got wounded when he was there. And when he healed from his wounds, they sent him to Europe to train, militarily train the people in the underground there. And that's how he met my mother. Uh, and he never left her. And um, he's the only father I knew, because they married. And you just to tell it not to move ahead without me. So Bert and the other Brigada unit mates were so proud of their role during the war, they showed the world that Jews could be soldiers and fight, and not just be meekly led to the slaughter, which is what happened at the camps. And not only that, these men were the nucleus of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, um, that fought for Israel to exist. So a little bit about my rescue. Uh, at the end of 1944 and the beginning of 1945, as the war was ending, only half of Holland had been liberated. My mother and Bert were in the liberated southern part of Holland. I was still in a bunker in the northern part of Holland uh, in the hands of Nazis. Um, I was sort of told, and I can't vouch for this, that our bunker was found, and I think I mentioned that before, so that when Bert and Helga, my mom, managed to find me, I was no longer in that bunker. I was with uh, nuns. I was uh, taking cover with, with nuns who found me uh, and, and took me in. Bert had managed to commandeer a, a military vehicle uh, in which they made their way to the north. And then once they found me, they had to figure out how to get back down south. Uh, my mom said, told me at one time that when they saw me, she was rushing forward to try and pick me up to get me, but I didn't know who she was. I, I didn't know who the stranger was, and I screamed. Uh, and it stopped her, and she was so, herself was so hurt, not that she blamed me, but she was so hurt by the fact that her own child, whom she had given away, not knowing whether she was going to see her again or not, at this point rejected her so vocally. 
As my mother began to share a little bit more, this is me uh, about six months or so after I was connected back with my mom. Um, my mom started sharing with me very little, but as she did, my own nightmares, because I didn't really have conscious memories of my two years in the bunker, but I had memories, and I couldn't explain what that was. It, I thought I was just weird, you know. And as, as other children of Holocaust survivors who were in a similar situation as I uh, will share with you, I belong to a hidden infant funded, a hidden child foundation under the ADL umbrella, and we have a subgroup called the Hidden Infant, which I'm lucky enough to facilitate at this point. And the stories, that was the first time I heard other stories that, that were a little bit like my own. Um, and I understood that this kind of impact, being isolated and away from human contact for two years, it leaves you, it leaves you with a whole bunch of not good stuff. Uh, there is a psychiatrist by the name of Bessel van der Kolk, and some of you, if you're in that field, might know he's the foremost um, uh, man about... Um, okay, the, the word flew out of my brain right now. When you have post-traumatic post stress disorder, he is the one who's most knowledgeable in this country anyway, and in Europe as well, and he wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. He was right. The body keeps the score. My mind didn't fully keep it, but my body did. So my family married. My, my mother married Bert in Holland. This is my grandfather again, and my Oma. I call her Oma, even though she's my step-grandmother. She was my, my grandmother. And this is very shortly before my mom and I were put on a, uh, on a boat to Israel, on a ship to Israel. My father had to continue with his military uh, duties. It was like an Exodus-type ship, I guess. My father found, my father's Bert. I refer to him as my father because I didn't know Richard. So my father found his father uh, shortly as the camps were being liberated. And this is the man in the striped jacket here is Opa Solomon. And this is a crematorium. And... Um, he brought him to Israel to live with us. And here's an interesting thing about this man. He was a little touched, for a better, lack of a better word. And he once yelled at my mother when she was making chip, chicken soup for putting water in the pot. He said to her, I was starving at Dachau. Why are you diluting my food? Soup is made with water. But that's how... He was, and also, if I had trouble with school or anything like that, he would look at me and say, what you have in here, they can never take away from you. And the irony of it is that they did take it away from him. And then 1948, beautiful state of Israel was born. This, okay. And this past August, my daughters, my son couldn't make it, my daughters and I and my three grandsons went to Amsterdam to visit the family over there. And we went to the Walls Monument and we found 11 members, 11 members of my family on that wall. Each brick has the name of one person. And we're sitting over here in Either this one or this one is my father, Richard. And um, it was very healing to be able to see the names. Thank you. I'm open to, for questions if anyone needs to ask or has any questions to ask. Thank you. I know I speak for very long. I apologize. So, thank you. <laughs>